Hello, this is Joaquin van Schoren. Welcome to part two of our lecture on data preprocessing. In the previous lecture, we saw how scaling and power transforms work. Now we'll look at categorical features. For instance, this case, we have information about people living in New York, and we have, first of all, the borough they live in, like Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, and Bronx. Uh, we have the salary, and then we want to predict whether they're vegan, right? So depending on where they live and how much they make, we want to predict whether they are vegan or not, or likely to be vegan. Um, now to do that with, for instance, a support vector machine, we need to, or neural network, we need to um, transform this feature into a numerical feature. And there are, again, different ways of doing that. The simplest way is just to assign a number, like we go first with Bronx, I think, it's, uh, I think they, it's sorted uh, alphabetically before. So the first one alphabetically is Bronx, which is zero, then you have Brooklyn, which is one, then Manhattan, which is two, and Queens, which is three. Right? So we just assign a number to every categorical value. Now, this may seem a good idea, but it's mostly not. Like, unless you have some ordinal meaning, like if Brooklyn is higher than Bronx and Queens is higher than Manhattan, then yeah, you can do that, but typically in this case, it doesn't make sense. Um, if you have features like very, sometimes you have these features like very high, uh, high and so on, and low, all these Likert scales and so on. Uh, in that case, it does make some sense that you give these numbers like 5, 4, and so on. Uh, but in many cases, uh, there is no ordinal meaning to that feature, so it doesn't make sense to give it a number. Why? Because if you would do this and you give it to your classifier, like a K and M, it would assume that, for instance, uh, Queens is much closer to Manhattan than Queens to the Bronx. I'm not sure that's true, <laughs> but um, it would just assume that based on the numbers that it sees, because 3 is closer to, to 2, then it's 3 is to 0. Right? So, yeah, so the, if, the, if the distance between those points don't make sense, then it's not a good idea to model the data in this way because your model will, well, use that information while it, it's actually noise or it's not used to information. Right? So in that case, you want to, for instance, look at one hot encoding, also known as dummy encoding. So it's a very simple technique uh, where we take all the values, so we have Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, and Bronx. And for each feature, we, uh, for, each, for each category, we create a new feature. Uh, I think, again, this is uh, alphabetical. So first we have our Bronx. And this feature will be zero unless the category is Bronx, and then we add one. Then for Brooklyn, it's zero unless the category is Brooklyn, and then we add one, and so on, right? So now our data is nice and numerical, and of course we remove this feature from the data after we uh, transformed it. Uh, and now our, we, have, we haven't shown away any information and our data is um, numeric. Right? So this seems very good. Uh, it's not always useful though. Uh, for instance, say that instead of having four values, maybe you have 200 values, which means you have two, you have to create 200 new features. So that means the data becomes high dimensional, becomes harder to learn, becomes easier to overfit. Some of these may be all zero. So there will be lots of problems um, with that. Uh, another problem that often occurs is that um, you have these features in the training sets, but then in the test set, uh, maybe you have Seven Island as another borrow that only occurs in the test set and on the training set, which means that whenever the algorithm encounters that and wants to transform this, it doesn't know what to do and it crashes. Um, so there's two things to do. So either, yes, you can let it crash uh, and then you resample the data yourself, or you can do some other tricks, um, depending on the tools that you use to uh, take care of this. Another common thing to do is to just ignore it. So whenever you have a value, whenever you encounter a new value like this, you would just represent it by all zeros in your test set. That's also possible. And the final encoding is called target encoding. 
It's called targeted coding because we'll actually look at the target feature. So it's a supervised technique. And the idea is that if we have a category and the category occurs together with a positive clause, so if every row in the data that has a category and that row also has the positive label, then we assign a value close to one. If, on the other hand, it correlates with the negative class, then we assign a value close to zero. So to illustrate, uh, so imagine our data here. We have um, some uh, feature Brooklyn. Brooklyn is always associated with a positive class vegan. That means we assign it a value close to one. And that, on the other hand, is uh, associated with zero most of the times, so it gets a value close to zero. If you would, for instance, flip this label and make it a 1, then Manhattan will be 50-50 associated with both, and then this value, the encoding will be 0.5. Right? So it's, it, it assigns one value well, per class. If you have multiple class, you will have multiple of these features. And the value tells you something about how likely uh, this category uh, will predict uh, 1 in the end. So the, the method comes from vision learning, uh, and basically it's, it's a combination of uh, the posterior, that's after we look at the category, what can we tell about the label? Um, and the prior. The prior is before you look at the category, what can we tell about the label? So before you look at the category, the best we can do is just look, okay, how many times do we have a positive label? It's just a ratio of positive examples, right? And then we have the posterior that's, okay, if you look at the label and we see that many, um, so NY, NYI is here, is a number of samples with category I and the positive class. So if you have many samples which have the category and are associated with the positive class, over all the points of uh, category I. If that ratio is large, then it has a large posterior probability that this uh, row will be a one. Okay. And so it's, you could just use this value here uh, and you would get a straight line here. So uh, if the more, the largest ratio, the larger uh, the value will be. And you can do that. Uh, it's actually, it's, it's, it's a valid technique. Um, but one problem with that is that say that you have a category and there's only like one value. It does, it does only, this, 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 the category I is only one row with category and this happens to be associated with class I, one. Right? Then if you would just do this, then you give a very high value even though you have, and you base it on one example. Right? So there's not a lot of evidence that this, um, uh, feature is actually associated with plus one, um, and still you give the high value. So to avoid that, we use this blending. Right? We blend the posterior probability with the probability. And we do that with an S-curve. So this complicated formula here is simply just the sigmoid curve. And blending means is we compute the sigmoid given at the point uh, that we measure, the, the number of occurrences uh, that of our category I and the target is, is one uh, times the posterior probability. Right? So this is simply the, the S curve. So it, it, it's like this, right? And we blend that with uh, one minus S curve. That's the opposite of this guy. Right? Um, yeah. So. And if we then blend that, we get something like this. So the posterior scaled uh, with this S curve gives you this. Right? So it's something like this, and it goes up and goes up. Right? While the posterior, the prior looks like this. So this depends on the ratio of, of the number of examples. And uh, it will also be an S curve, looks like this. And then the blend of those two will basically, well, some of the two, and then we get this red curve here. Um, this means that if we have no or very few uh, cases where we have our category I, 
we fall back to the, the prior one. We have no information other than just looking at the ratio of positive examples. If, however, uh, we see some little bit of evidence that uh, of, of, of this feature, of this category I, it will, well, it may actually go down a little bit because um, we have very little support that there is a correlation. But the more cases we see that this category is associated with a positive label, then this will go up to one. And yeah, yeah so it's, it's a nice way to uh, encode how, how much information this category tells us about. And so you uh, these values. For instance, if we have Brooklyn here, uh, we have uh, so NYI is two because we have two examples where we have Brooklyn and Venus one. The total number of cases where we have Brooklyn is also two. The total number of vegans is also two, uh, and no to total examples is six because we have six examples in total. If you then fill out this formula, we see we have zero point eight two, which is close to one. Uh, it's not super close to one. Why not? Because we only have two examples, which is not a lot of support. So uh, if you would have more and more cases, like if you if you, if you would have ten cases of Brooklyn, and they're all associated with vegan, this would become very close to one. 